Okay. The aim of this presentation is to introduce examples of commonly used typographic styles that appear on or were made for timepieces, largely focusing on timepieces made between the 17th and 20th centuries. Materials used in this presentation are formed of my dissertation submitted to the MATD program at the University of Reading in 2018, as well as ongoing research. The research was conducted through online sources and in person in the collections of the British and Science Museums in London, as well as in private collections and watch and clock workshops. Horology is the study of time, but it can also be used to describe the craft of making timepieces. Before getting into specific examples, I would like to quickly touch on some terminology, summarize the evolution of timekeeping uh, devices, as well as highlight a few um, techniques for displaying horological typography. The dial, often referred to as the face, is the main part of a timepiece that will display horological typography. Subdials are smaller sections found within the dial that are used to display specific indications, such as running seconds or calendar functions. The chapter ring will show the main running hour and minutes markings, and the scale, shown here in yellow, um, will often be found on stopwatches or chronographs and is a good area to look for additional horological typography. Timekeeping devices date back thousands of years to sites dotted around the globe. More complex mechanical timekeepers, such as the Antikythera mechanism, date back to 140 BCE. From the late 13th century, clocks started to appear around Europe and spread as a result of the development of guilds as well as religious immigration. The 17th and 18th centuries saw the miniaturization and higher production of clocks and watches. It also saw them become more individualized. Clocks were made for the house and watches for the individual. The 19th century into the 20th century saw the craft fully industrialized in countries like the United States and Switzerland. Timepieces in the 21st century are largely remained in our uh, digital devices. However, there remains an industry of companies and individuals who create more traditionally crafted analog timepieces. Oops. Okay, moving on to some techniques. Engraving is a well-documented technique in the type world, and it is often found as well in the horological one. Engraving was commonly done by hand. However, as production numbers increased, pantographs were used. Engravings were generally filled with ink, lacquer, or gold, as in the case of this hour numeral from a Japanese clock dating between the 18th and 19th centuries. Painting was used on dials, however, as production numbers increased, a technique known as pad printing became dominant. Pad printing makes a use of four main components, a vertically sliding flexible printing pad, a horizontally sliding bed, a printing plate known as a cliche, and the watcher clock dial to be printed. The process begins with the inking of the cliche. The ink from the filled hollows of the cliche is then picked up by the flexible pad. The ink is then deposited onto the dial by pressing the pad to its surface. Early pad printing machines used a gelatin pad, however, modern ones use materials like silicone. Here we can see an example of a modern pad printing machine. Pad printing offers many benefits to watchmakers and clockmakers. The flexible pad excels at depositing an inked image on a non-flat surface, and there are quite a few watch dials that are either domed or have other textures on them. Dials are generally made from metal or glass rather than paper, and this means that there is very little ink spread from the printing process. It also allows a high degree of per precision as each part can be locked into the machine. Prints with multiple colors can be made with essentially no registration errors, as only the cliché and the ink color can be swapped out. The dial that you can see on the top right is an example of a multicolor print dial 
So each color there would be using a different printing plate. And having looked very closely at it, there are essentially no registration errors. Taking multiple impressions from the same inked cliche can uh, yield thick prints, such as the glossy 12 numeral that you can see in the bottom right-hand corner. OK, on to some examples. Antiquarian horological typography for this presentation is going to focus largely on numeral forms from the Middle Ages to the 19th century, as horology went from craft to industrialized trade. Many timepieces featured engraved numerals. However, as they shrunk from clock to watch, painting and printing became more dominant processes for displaying horological typography. Most antiquarian horological timepieces used Roman numerals for the hours arrayed radially around the dial. There are Gothic styles. However, by the 17th century, most numerals took the form of elongated characters with hairline serifs. One particularity of horological typography is the use for four eyes for the fourth hour, rather than the more common IV that we'd see printed in a book. This could come likely from the result of trying to visually balance the dial. However, there are also examples of ancient sundials that make use of four eyes. Horology is a field that greatly depends on tradition, and the use of four eyes on Roman uh, numeral dials is an example of this. Arabic numerals were also used. However, they often were relegated to marking out the minutes or other smaller functions like calendar displays. Most numerals featured large bowls and terminated in thin tapered strokes. Ball, termina ball terminals were occasionally used for numerals like six and nine. However, this was not consistent. The two timepieces we see here on the left are an astronomical clock made by the English watchmaker Henry Bridges in 1733, while the example on the right is a French long case clock made between 1735 and 1745. They both feature very similar numerals and are typical of um, what we would see from Arabic numerals in the antiquities. In 1783, a set of slanted Arabic numerals were designed by Abraham Louis Breguet, who remains one of the most important watchmaking uh, figures of history. This set of numerals has become one of the most well-known and distinct st uh, styles of typography within horology. The example here seen is circa 1798 and features painted numerals on an enamel dial. Unlike Roman numerals, slanted Breguet numerals are traditionally arranged standing up rather than radially. The close-up of the dial on the right also shows a secret signature typical of Breguet watches. It was likely made with the use of a pantograph. Breguet numerals began to be used by other watchmakers and eventually brands. The Swiss brand Longines classifies two styles of numeral as Breguet in a dial catalog from the early 20th century. The slanted set is generally only used for hours and can come in various widths and weights. Typical features of this style are an asymmetrically weighted zero and a long flagged one. The bowl of the two curls into itself and there is an extra stroke near the end of the crossbar of the four while the six and nine remain open. The upright style also uses a two with an extended curl in its bowl. The crossbar of the four terminates with an upward serif um, that can either be a line or a small wedge, and the six and nines remain open. The upright style can be used for both larger hours as well as smaller subdial numerals, as you can see here on the um, right-hand Longines dial. Two more examples of Breguet numerals being used by other brands can be seen here. This Fears pocket watch from 1910 uses them painted on an enamel dial, while the much smaller wristwatch from Patek Philippe uses cut out numerals um, on its gold dial. It also features the upright set of numerals in its seconds subdial. Turkish numerals are an example of stylistic changes made for a specific market, in this case, the Turkish market. Exports of watches made by Western European makers to the Ottoman Empire date from the 17th century and increased greatly into the 18th century. 
Trade was still active in the 19th century as evidenced by this watch made between 1810 and 1820 by Preguet, who at this point had incorporated one of his sons into the business. Turkish market watchers featured a highly interpretive version of Persian numerals. The George Pryor watch seen on the left is from 1794. It also features painted numerals on an enamel dial and features um, smaller minute numerals also expressed in the Turkish form to mark out the five minute sections on the chapter ring. The earlier unsigned Turkic market watch seen on the right from 1675 uses engraved numerals that are ink filled. Here is a comparison between Western Arabic, Eastern Arabic, Persian, and finally Turkish numerals to show you some of the relation between the forms. While West, um, Eastern Arabic and Persian numerals make use of vertical and diagonal strokes in their construction, the Turkish forms straighten all of these into symmetrical triangular shapes. The cups and the bodies typically found in Arabic and Persian typography are also transformed into crescent shapes. The zero is usually described as a small symmetrically weighted circle more similar to a Latin O and aligned to the cap height. The five matches the height of the other numerals and disregards the stroke emphasis of Arabic calligraphy. I should also note that the five and six appear to more closely resemble the Eastern Arabic forms rather than the Persian ones. The numerals are made from a simple construction of modular forms with minimal variations seen here to the right. Multi-stroke numerals tended to have the forms remain as separate pieces rather than have the strokes or shapes joined together. Turkish numerals are an example of a style forced to fit within certain cultural norms. Radially arrayed Roman numerals were still the dominant style at this era. This graphic shows how the Turkish numerals fit more closely to the structure of Roman numerals than to their source of Persian and Eastern Arabic. Notably, the numerals were aligned to the center of the triangular shape rather than the center of the character. This could have been the result of the numerals being made on a rotating jig to aid in their standardization and placement on the dial. Now, moving from antiquity to modernity, the 20th century saw the wristwatch replace the pocket watch as the main personal timekeeper. At this point, timepieces were, uh, were being made on a fully industrialized scale. Unlike the traditional radial numeral arrangement from earlier dials, the 20th century featured a more diverse set of displays for hour and numerals, hours and other numerals on dials. While Roman numerals and contrasted weighted typography persisted, monolinear typography began to dominate the industry. Monolinear horological typography is perhaps most easily recognized by the use of horizontal extension bars, regardless of letter width. This is especially visible in the A and 4 and can help to open up the inner space of the character. Letter forms were uh, mainly expressed as boxy characters or a boxy structure, and it was common for our numerals to fit within a square rather than a more condensed form. Occasionally, flat parallel base and cap lines were used for letters like C, G, and S, and nearly all dial typography was printed in uppercase. However, there are consistent uh, exceptions to this on watches. It is also common to see multiple widths and sizes of letters and numerals appear on the same dial. A good example of this is um, the image to the bottom left, which is a Rolex uh, date just, as well as the date wheel uh, directly to its right, which features three different widths of numerals. In terms of finding more letter forms, world timer watches are a good object to look for, such as in the case of this mid-century Patek Philippe watch. Um, it features tiny engraved numerals that have been ink filled. Now you may have noticed that despite a monolinear construction, many of the letter forms uh, featured from this 20th century section feature small serifs, and this is why I hesitate to call them a sans serif letter form. These flared stroke endings were likely the result of the engraving process to create the printing plates or the cliches. 
Flared stroke endings, however, are not just a production byproduct. They help to preserve the appearance of flat stroke endings in the dial type, especially at small sizes. The 11 numeral seen here in red on this scale is about 0.75 millimeters tall, or about two point, and it is quite readable by the eye with no magnification. The one on the top right is how it would appear to us with no magnification. However, the form on the bottom right is much closer to the engraved or printed numeral that would actually be on the dial. Rather than making everything in-house, brands would often rely on specialists like dial makers who would often supply multiple different brands at once. This could uh, explain why we see variations in shared styles across the industry. To give an indication of the scale of the industry, the 17th edition of the trade book, Indicateur d'Avoine, from 1927, features 55 different companies listed under the subject of dials. While some of these companies may have been responsible for making the metal blanks for dials, it is safe to assume that more than a few worked with horological typography in some way. On the right, we can see samples from the German dial maker Weber und Barrel, who supplied domestic brands like Stova and Lange in the 1930s. Some of their designs are still in use today. Other dial makers like Singer or Stern became hugely important suppliers in the 20th century. While contemporary watch brands will occasionally purchase an entire dial maker and bring them in-house, the reverse can also be true. The family overseeing the Stern dial making company took over ownership of the lauded watch brand Patek Philippe in the 1930s. The use of a shared numeral style is perhaps best demonstrated in the chronographs or stopwatches of the second half of the 20th century. This set of square numerals began to be used across the industry seemingly beginning with the Omega Speedmaster in 1957. The watch pictured at left is a later Speedmaster, but it features the very same numerals in its subdials. The numerals retain the typical flat top four seen across the industry. However, the rest of the form is much closer to something we might expect from the uh, Nebbiolo foundry. They can feature more or less prominent uh, flared stroke endings. However, this probably is more dependent on the age or the quality of the cliche used to print them. In casual observation online, I have identified at least two dozen watch brands that use this style of numeral. And while they mostly appear in subdials, they can appear on other parts of the dial and at different sizes, especially on watches from the 1970s. An example of this can be seen in the top right image of this slide. From the 1980s, print fonts started to be used in the watch industry. They have completely proliferated since then, and this has led to incredibly expensive or exclusive timepieces making use of quite pedestrian desktop fonts. Increased attention, however, and a resurgence of popularity of mid 20th century styles has seen a few brands return to using custom typographic solutions and this is um, especially seen in the past five years. As mentioned before, tradition is a very important part of watch and clock making. While the dial maker Weber und Barrel no longer exists, the German brand Nomos has revived some of its modernist designs. The brand Stova, who were a client of Weber and Barrel in the 1930s, also continues to use designs from their back catalog. On the more artisanal side, the Japanese micro brand Naoya Hida & Co makes use of hand engraved lacquer filled numerals on their dials, bringing antiquarian techniques to the current day. Handcrafting aside, modern machinery such as CNC and wire erosion machines, as well as later cut laser cutters, allow for unprecedented fidelity to reproducing the curves and details of digitally designed typography. The watch on the left from the Fears Watch Company uses CNC cut applied numerals for its hour, um, hour markers. New printing techniques and materials are also available. Rather than pad printing with ink, the Charles Frodsham double impulse chronometer 
uses a chromium oxide, which is applied onto its ceramic dial via vapor deposition. Some of the marks on this dial only measure 12 microns wide, but are still crisply defined. I would like to conclude this presentation with a few examples of typographic outliers and curiosities, beginning with an astronomical clock made by John Naylor between 1720 and 1725. It retains the typical layout of other clocks of the era, but features fantastically wavy hour numerals. This clock can be found in the collection of the British Museum. On the left, this watch made by Jean-Antoine Lépine, cased in 1788, features mixed Roman and Arabic numerals, as well as the uncommon for horological typography, IV for the fourth hour. This choice of typography was likely more influenced by the mechanics within the watch, as it is a chiming watch, which essentially chimes the hours in a different fashion from other watches made in that era. While print fonts have been used more commonly over the past 40 years, one notable forerunner are the numerals of Roger Excoffon's Banco, which appeared on a Girard Perrego watch within the first 10 years of Banco's release in the mid 20th century. Turning to a more dangerous form of horological typography, luminescent numerals and markings became important on watches at the beginning of the 20th century. These watches used a mix of radium paint uh, mixed with phosphorescent materials to create glowing numerals. The watch collector and researcher Kathleen McGivney has given a lecture to the Horological Society of New York detailing many of the uses and applications of radium in watches. I've included some of the information here, but I would encourage anyone who's interested in the subject to go look up her talk. The numerals were painted by hand, and the workers, who at this time were often young women, were instructed to lick their brushes in order to keep a fine tip. And this led to copious radioactive ingestion. These workers, who became known as the radium girls, were said to glow visibly when they left the factories. Eventually, high sickness and mortality rates led to a um, workplace injury lawsuit led by the Radium Girls, which was successful in 1927 and led to worker safety reform, not only in the watch industry, but across industries in the United States. Radium began to be phased out um, and it was eventually replaced with tritium. However, for the past 30 years, a non-radioactive compound called superluminova has been used uh, for glowing numerals in the watch industry. Prege numerals were not the only style of Arabic numeral with a contrasting stroke to be used across watch brands. So-called fantasy, grec, and a Schwabacher style can be found on watches from Longines, Sima, Hamilton, and others from the late 19th century into the first half of the 20th century. These styles largely fell uh, out of use um, by the middle of the 20th century. However, Longines did revive the fantasy style on a watch in 2016. It has not seen wider re-adoption throughout the industry. It is important to note that the scope of this presentation is not close to being uh, exhaustive. Clocks, especially public clocks, could be studied more. I have also not uh, covered the typography of digital uh, timepieces, nor have I focused on the styles of logo types and brand signatures. There are also many more stylistic uh, examples and variations to be found within 20th century monolinear horological typography, and this is certainly a subject I look forward to researching um, going into the future. Accessibility is not always easy, as many of these objects are prohibitively expensive, and a lot of the documentation either doesn't exist or is kept in private collections. I would like to thank Baruch Kutz, the British Museum, the Philips Watch uh, Division, and my employer, Fears Watch Company, uh, for access to materials and images used in this presentation. I hope you have all enjoyed this introduction and overview into horological typography. Thank you.
Yeah. Sure. That was awesome. Thank you so much. Now, I know we are running late, but I also told our esteemed Presidente that he had time, so I think we do have time for one or two questions while we're waiting for him to return. Any questions out there? I have one myself, which is I'm curious, what of all the type you've seen on timepieces, what was the least appropriate or strangest thing you've ever seen, do you think? Um, appropriate is an interesting term. Um, Fair enough. Uh, some of you, I heard some chuckles when I mentioned desktop fonts being used. I would say that that is an example of um, a completely appropriate printing um, method. The numerals and typography are clearly expressed on the dials. However, I would say they don't um, necessarily reflect the ethos of some of the objects that they are on. Fair. Right. Any, any other questions out there? Chris, are you here? Nope. Right. I have <clears throat> um, I have one other uh, oddball thing. What is your favorite of all, all things you've seen used on a, a watch dial? Did you... I, I do have a soft spot for the monolinear forms. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I, I don't want to use subjective terms uh, here, but it is something that I find quite attractive on watch dials and the um, treatment of the size of them I find quite attractive as well. Um, you see a bit of a loss of that now. Um, so quite a lot of the watches from the, the mid 20th century are um, what I would regard as like personal favorite. Cool. Well, thank you so much.
It's me, Dan Radigan.